joined by the security consultant Chidi Wanu. Uh, Chidi, let's start first then with the, uh, the essentially four attacks across four different continents. IS have claimed responsibility in Kuwait, uh, Al Shabaab in Somalia. Um, if these attacks are indeed linked, how worrying is it for the intelligence services in the West and across the world? Uh, if they're linked, which there is a strong possibility that the attacks in Tunisia, France and Kuwait will be linked. The attack in Somalia, it's less likely, but we can, we'll see. If they are linked and it shows an increase in capability for ISIS or Daesh, and, um, it, it also demonstrates that they're able to collaborate and cooperate without being detected across three different countries, three different time zones, with uh, three different natures of attack, and that's very, very worrying. And when you look at the situation in France, um, in February, we saw the, the horrible scenes at Charlie Hebdo, um, another seemingly homegrown radicalization case here, um, which is very near Lyon, another big city for France. How, um, how, I guess, how could you say, how pertinent is it in France that these people are being radicalized? Because there's four million Muslims within France, so is there a way of tackling it? The there are ways of tackling it, but um, it's, I mean, as you mentioned, the fact that it's coming from a homegrown, self-radicalized, you know, uh, virtually lone wolf type situation is very, very, these are very, very French uh, problems. I mean, we have the situation in France with the banlieues of, um, the, you know, the French, the migrants from North Africa who are kept on the outskirts of the cities and, you know, segregated from normal life, you know, have difficulty getting jobs, getting access to education and creating a, a kind of ghettoization and these people are very very vulnerable to radicalization you know if if it was in the old days they'd be you know subject to fascism or communism nowadays Islamic radicalism is is that thing and because it's a different thing it's different from you know French uh, France which is you know a Christian country uh, by and large it, it, it appeals to that to a subset. So it's a very difficult thing to tackle, especially as most people seem to be self-radicalized and also they don't seem to be seeking any higher purpose other than to achieve, uh, you know, jihad. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, 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 a prob it's a specifically French problem, not that we don't have that same problem in the UK, mm -hmm. but France, I think, is a bigger issue for them. Sure. When we look at the Tunisian situation, 37 people killed, holidaymakers essentially, on the beach. Of frightening scenario. How do you think that tourism will be affected in Tunisia? Because six million tourists visited the country last year. It, it will have a devastating effect and that exactly was the point of this attack. This is classic propaganda of the deed where the attackers target something which will have, a, by, its, by its very nature, will be self-generating in terms of publicity. So by killing foreigners, Brits, uh, Irish, uh, French, Americans, the media from each country will be involved, will focus in on Tunisia. Tunisia, although it has the impression of being a, you know, a stable secular state, has a huge uh, you know, Islamic fundamentalist problem. It contributes the most um, by, by proportion uh, of fighters uh, to, uh, to Daesh in Syria. Uh, Libya, a strong proportion of IS in, in Libya are Tunisians. So it's a, it's a big... It's a, it's, it's a, it's a big problem that's kind of hiding under the currents and this is, a, as, as far as we can see, is a well-targeted, very, very um, you know, strategic attack and mm -hmm. all three attacks seem to have happened within an hour of each other. Yeah. All seem to be targeting specific um, demographics which are within the, what I'd say, the tick box of the, the IS target group. And, um, yeah, it, it, it does seem to be a fairly worrying phenomenon. And all this, of course, happening um, against the backdrop of IS killing more people in a counterinsurgency uh, on the border town of Kobani. So do you think what's happening out in Syria and Iraq is directly related to what we're seeing today? It's related. It's, it's a, the answer is going to be uh, it is related and it's unrelated. Because what you'll see is uh, in terms of um, Daesh in uh, Syria and Iraq, they want, they're on the back foot in a way. They're, they're, you know, they're fighting hard in Ramadi. They're, they're losing towns. But they're also counterattacking. They're take counterattacking in Syria. They're counterattacking in in, um, in Iraq. A, a lot of these attacks, a lot of these propaganda videos, are linked to these counterattacks. It's, it's again something Boko Haram does quite well. As well. they'll release these videos, which give this impression of invincibility, this, this impression of great reach, and uh, it helps to demoralize the enemy. So just by you know showing a few beheading videos of people being beheaded by death courts, that terrifies people, and it helps you know propagate the myth of ISIS invincibility. And it also sort of helps in the indoctrination as well with people in the West. But Chidi, thank you very much. But I want to get your views on this next story now, because an Islamic court in Nigeria has sentenced uh, nine people to death after finding them guilty of blasphemy. The nine, including a Muslim cleric, all pleading 
pleading guilty to insulting the Prophet Muhammad during a closed hearing in the northern city of Kano. Four others who had been accused were released. The sentencing was done in secret uh, due to safety concerns after the court was attacked last month. It's not known whether or when even the sentence uh, will be carried out. So, Chidi, when we look at this story here, um, how sort of rare is it for a case like this to happen in a Nigerian court in the north? It's, um, it's rare in terms of... Um there have been capital uh, cases in, with, from the Sharia courts. Um, someone was sentenced to death a few years ago. But an actual uh, capital case for blasphemy is extremely rare. But again, we need to look at it in the context of, um, the north, of northern Nigeria and Islam in Nigeria as well. This, uh, the accused are from, uh, from the Tijania sect, which is fairly peaceful. I mean, uh, Yusuf Nduru is uh, maybe the most famous Tijania of, uh, in modern day. And he's a musician, you know, he sings, he performs. So it's a fairly moderate um, kind of Sufi sect. So it would appear that this is, how would I put it, uh, maybe an aberration from the, from the Tijania because, uh, or somebody who maybe spoke out of excitement, proclaiming that his sheikh was, you know, the equivalent of the prophet. And this has enraged, uh, you know, a, um, a huge population of, of Kano. Kano is a hotbed. It's the, large, it's one, the largest city in the northern Nigeria. It's a very wealthy place, a, a, power, uh, a power and a powder keg, if, if you can describe it as such. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the sentence in itself is not a surprise, as they would have to pander to the, to the crowd, as it were. But uh, how, what it means for you know, constitutionality in Nigeria is another question. And the, the Islamic courts there operate alongside the secular courts. So how, how effective is the system there? Uh, again, a very... A very, very uh, a very interesting question. Uh, the system, there were the typical complaints about the legal system in Nigeria is, uh, is, is characterized like many countries or many uh, less developed countries by, you know, uh, a long wait for, for justice, um, corruption and, uh, diffi uh, you know, difficulties in access industries, particularly if you're poor. The Sharia courts, you would think, maybe would alleviate that, but it's not the case. It's still seen as a court where the rich, you know, get their way and the poor, you know, um, just get punished. So this sentence, although it is a populist sentence because it does, you know, it, it, it takes these people away from, uh, from the mainstream. I mean, after the, the initial um, action, the man's, uh, the sheikh's house was burned down, there were riots, there were mobs, you know, calling for violence. In fact, the original court where he was being tried was burned down. So this is a populist action. And also, in the context of, you know, Sharia and Islamic law, it was, this is a sentence in the Islamic law, uh, Islamic uh, Clerks were were um, were consulted, so there might not be the reaction that you saw maybe with the the death or the murder of uh, Muhammad Yusuf, but it's still controversial in terms of Nigeria's uh, law uh, constitution because this is a a religious court carrying out uh, a capital offence on something which is a purely religious matter, as in blasphemy, not for murder or for rape mm -hmm. or for robbery. Chidi Nwanu, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you.